couple he'd ever worked for in a divorce, so he chose another option. Nightmare in Suburbia at eight, after a former royal aide in the dock in Snapped Women Who Kill. It was a Cinderella story, complete with a palace. She was thrilled to bits to be working from Buckingham Palace. And a Prince Charming. She couldn't hardly conceal her delight, you know. So, oh, this really lovely man. But when the fairy tale became a murder mystery... Death has been caused, in this case, by a knife into his heart and massive loss of blood. The case captured the imagination of the country. The scorned lover and a vilified member of the royal family. You couldn't write this. But no one knew just how twisted the story would become. It was very distressing to learn the whole scenario of what had happened that night. Well, it was a surprise package, to be frank. Monday, the 18th of September, 2000. Around 3.15 p.m., the Metropolitan Police received a frantic phone call from the home of 38-year-old businessman Tom Cressman. The caller was an employee of Tom's. he just found his boss on the bedroom floor with a knife in his chest. His hands were like that, as if to pull it away. You don't have to be a rocket scientist to work out that someone's killed somebody. Lying nearby was a piece of sports equipment. Tommy had been clearly hit over the head with a cricket bat. It's kind of a very English case. If he had a cup of tea and a copy of the Times next to him, it wouldn't have been out of place, really. The police arrived within minutes, but it was far too late for Tom. A large amount of blood had been lost, and he looked as if a rigor mortis set in. But who would want Tom Cressman dead? When they discovered that Tom's 33-year-old live-in girlfriend, Jane Andrews, was missing, they started wondering. The question I was asking, did she commit the murder and was she going to commit suicide? Second thing was, was there a third party involved and had she been kidnapped? Either way, it was critical that Jane be found. Everybody was just in a state of such shock and all trying to phone her and get hold of her. Worried for Jane's safety, the police made a public appeal. She was due to go to work on Sunday, never turned up. Due to go to work on Monday and never turned up. Meanwhile, they've alerted ports and airports for sightings of Miss Andrews or her car, a white M-registered Volkswagen Polo. One offer of assistance came from a person guaranteed to make Jane front page news. Sarah Ferguson, the Duchess of York, Jane's former employer. She and Fergie were clearly very close. The more detectives learned about Jane Andrews and Tom Cressman, the more urgent it became to find Jane. They certainly wanted to find her, you know, um, as much as anything to make sure she was all right. When Jane Andrews met Tom Cressman in 1998, she had long since left her past behind. She came from a working class background in what's deemed in this country to be a very working class environment. After leaving college with a fashion degree, 22-year-old Jane answered an ad for a job as a personal assistant to a working mother. I think it was advertising for a busy mother that needed some help and indeed turned out to be a very busy mother. It may not have sounded like a dream job, but it turned out to be the opportunity of a lifetime. She's invited for an interview. Who should it be but uh, Sarah Ferguson, the, uh, the Duchess of York? She was a young mother, newly married, young children, travelling all over the world, and needed somebody to, to take care of whatever she needed. Jane had exactly the qualities the Duchess was looking for. She strives to do the best she can, and once described herself to me as, um, as a perfectionist. Jane worked for Fergie for almost 10 years. She was thrilled to bits to be working from Buckingham Palace. She literally did dedicate her life to her job and to her boss and to the family. She applied the same dedication to her personal life. She worked hard at meeting the right person. She put a lot of herself into meeting somebody. She didn't find it difficult to have boyfriends. But she was finding it difficult to meet Mr. Wright. And with every new relationship, Jane's perfectionism seemed to border on the obsessive. 
maybe she pushed a little too hard in some situations. And I did tell her, kind of just back off a little bit maybe, you know, just give the guy a bit of space. Jenny uh, was one who suffered with low self-esteem. Jane wasn't the only one having trouble with her love life. Fergie and Prince Andrew divorced in 1996. And a year after that, Jane was out of a job. Fergie had to cut back and it was Jane who bore the brunt of that. Jane was devastated by the end of her job. It was her life and suddenly that part of her life had gone. And I think she didn't know what to replace it with. You've been so trusted and so needed and so uncool for 10 years and all of a sudden not to have that, it would be, uh, it would be quite an adjustment. By the end of 1998, Jane still hadn't found a full-time position. I don't think it was easy for her to find the right thing for her. And money was running out. She was having problems paying her mortgage. She was going to have to rent her flat out. She didn't know where she was going to live. Friends decided she needed a distraction, something to take Jane's mind off her desperate straits. They set Jane up on a date with a mutual friend, a rich London businessman named Tom Cressman. The girl who arranged the blind date with Jane, I know she was very sorry for Jane because she was so disappointed at losing her job. One date later, and Jane's traumatic year appeared to be forgotten. Oh, she could not hardly conceal her delight, you know. So, oh, met this really lovely man. He wasn't technically a prince, but the rich and charming 38-year-old was close enough. Tom was what I would call the boy with all the toys. He had the boat, he had the classic cars, he liked to go to nice places, good holidays, go out. He was always good fun. Always laughing, kind of filled a room with his laugh. Meeting Tommy really was very uplifting for her. You know, it was nice to see her happy. Not only did Tom lift Jane's spirits, he also solved her more immediate worry. Before long, he offered her a place to stay. He suggested at the time that she move into his spare room on the top floor of his house. Tom lived in a sort of big place in leafy Fulham where people like Hugh Grant live and lots of TV presenters and uh, certainly very, very well off people live there. So uh, he had the room and uh, in moved Jane. The arrangement was only supposed to be temporary until she found a home. But over the next few months, it became clear that she thought she'd already found one. He was doing her a favor, letting her stay in his room rent-free upstairs. And then the next thing we knew, <laughs> Jane had moved down a floor. I don't think he sort of consciously went to say, this is the girl for me. This is somebody I want to go out with, have a relationship with. I think it just sort of happened. When they first met Jane, Tom's family weren't impressed with the new woman in his life. I thought if she was Tom's choice, that was fine, but that was about as far as it went, as far as I was concerned. I first met Jane one afternoon at my mother's house. She didn't come across as a great personality. She was very busy sewing little roses onto bathing suits that she informed us she was going to send to the Duchess of York's two girls because she missed the little princesses enormously. Jane made no secret about her feelings for Tom or her hopes for the future. She would glow around him, definitely. She really fell in love with him. I remember once asking her, do you think you're going to marry this man? She looked at me and she said, well, I hope so. But as the relationship progressed over the next year, friends started noticing tensions. He could be quite snappy with Jane. He was so condescending and spoke to her like she was a child. But did he do more than patronize her? One incident in November of 1999 left Jane with her wrist in a bandage and her friends a little unsure. She had sprained some bone and she did go to the hospital, but no allegation of abuse or physical assault. They'd been dancing and I remember thinking, wow, you know, that's a bit excessive. She said that she had fallen. Whatever caused the sprain, it looked as if the couple were heading for a break. As the relationship grew, she did become more and more possessive with Tom. It really became quite a, an obsession relationship. 
So why wouldn't Tom end things himself? It wasn't so simple, according to his family. She would threaten suicide at times not quite the drop of a hat, but <laughs> if, if there was any sort of conflict, that would be her answer to it. And I think that worried him immensely. Tom stuck it out for another year. In September of 2000, around their second anniversary, Tom took Jane on a two-week holiday to the Mediterranean. They spent several days with Tom's family at his mother's home in the south of France. When Tom whisked Jane away to Italy on his boat, Jane seemed sure he had an ulterior motive. It was pretty clear that Jane's expectation on their trip to Italy was that Tommy would probably propose to her. But would the romantic getaway Jane expected lead to a wedding or a funeral? Late Sunday morning, on the 17th of September, Barbara Cressman called her son in London from her home in the south of France. It had been two days since Tom and Jane had flown home to England, and when his mother couldn't reach him, she wasn't concerned, at least not at first. I thought, they've gone to have Sunday lunch together somewhere nice, so be it. But when Sunday turned to Monday, and still no return call, Barbara began to worry. When she didn't hear from him by Monday afternoon, she tried his office. I called the office and was told that he hadn't come in yet. And then was when I asked one of his employees to go over and see if he was all right. As the hours passed without word, Barbara Cressman began to fear the worst. I'd been sitting in the dark and I just knew something awful, awfully, awful was wrong. The phone finally rang late that evening, but the voice on the line wasn't Tom or the employee she'd sent to his house. It was London Metropolitan Police Liaison Officer Paula Marshall. Paula said, I have to tell you that your son is dead. It's a numbing sort of thing to have anyone tell you. And um, I just knew that was the kind of news I was going to get. Exactly what had gone wrong, Officer Marshall didn't know but she did tell Barbara that Jane was missing. None of Jane's friends had seen or heard from her since she and Tom had returned from France, and the police feared for her safety. She hadn't been seen for a couple of days. Her car wasn't there. But when Barbara called to break the news to her other children, she couldn't help voicing her own suspicion about her son's death. She just said, Kath, she's killed him. Barbara Cressman would return home to bury her son while the police raced to prevent a second funeral. She seemed to be going in and out of it, almost like conscious, unconscious, slurry, etc. On Tuesday, the 19th of September, 2000, the UK woke to sensational headlines. The story broke that a rich businessman who lived with a former aide of Fergie had been found murdered in his house and his uh, girlfriend uh, was missing. The missing girlfriend was 33-year-old Jane Andrews, a former aide to Sarah Ferguson, the Duchess of York. Jane's businessman boyfriend, 38-year-old Tom Cressman, had been found stabbed to death. A friend of mine rang me up and said, go and get a newspaper. And I think my first thoughts were, God, Jenny's dead. I just kind of really believed she would be dead. And then it was like, no, Tommy's dead. And I'm like, oh. The police had issued an appeal for anyone who might know Jane's whereabouts. Several of Jane's friends immediately tried to reach her on her mobile. I think I must have rang her day and night. It was probably 100 calls, if not 200 calls. I tried to call her, sent her texts, didn't have any response at all. Even Jane's former employer, the Duchess of York, tried to help. The Duchess of York was texting her and phoning her all the time. But as the hours passed with no response, everyone began to wonder, was Jane unwilling to respond, or was she unable? The clock was ticking. While both the police and friends frantically searched for Jane, detectives were busy gathering evidence at the crime scene. The first 24 hours are what we term the golden hour, which means generally if you miss the main clues in those 24 hours, it's very difficult to uh, retrieve them subsequently. Tom's clothes and the position of his body suggested he had been killed sometime during the night. 
Tom was found in his pyjamas. He was either asleep or getting ready for bed. He'd gone face down between the bed and the wall with his hands over the knife, and the pillow was sort of placed over that gap on top of him. An initial scan of the house revealed Tom had been stabbed with one of his own knives. It was apparent very early on that the murder weapon was a knife from the knife block in the kitchen. A closer examination of the body showed that a knife hadn't been the only weapon used on Tom. And it was an indentation on his um, forehead. Detectives believe they'd found the answer on the floor near his bed. There was a cricket bat on one side of the room. The likely murder weapons weren't all that was found at the scene. There were also plenty of clues suggesting who had wielded the knife and bat. The police also found post-it notes. Jane had written sort of saying Tom was cruel and uh, various other, other things. There was one that said, what have I done? Which indicated that, you know, maybe she flipped and done something. They also found a woman's dressing gown covered in blood and evidence that someone, presumably Jane, had taken a shower. Her clothes were in a little pile on the landing and shower and tub upstairs were bloodstained. We found a lot of blood in the sinkhole around the sink subsequently. But why would Jane Andrews kill the man she wanted to marry? What had happened over their holiday to lead to murder? While the forensic team continued to process the crime scene, detectives began interviewing Tom and Jane's friends and family. They started with the last people to see Tom and Jane alive, Tom's mother, Barbara, and nephew, David. Barbara and David had been with the couple on Friday the 15th of September as they drove to the airport to catch a flight home from France. It had been a very uncomfortable drive. Jane was constantly at Tommy's throat, um, rowing and sh shouting and screaming the whole way, saying things like, you know, you've, you've wasted the last couple of my years of my life. Jane didn't confine her rage to the occupants of the car. She spent a lot of time on the phone as well, trying to humiliate my Uncle Tommy in front of both Grandma and myself. All we could hear, of course, was her end of the conversation. When they interviewed Jane's friends, they discovered that one of the people Jane had called from the car was Gil Hancock's. They wanted specifics, you know, what happened that day, when she called you, what did she say? Gill recounted the conversation for detectives. She was stressed and she was upset. She said, I can't do this anymore. When he asked Jane where she was, she told him she was in the car with Tom on the way to the airport. And I thought, well, wow, things must be pretty tough if she's talking like this on the phone while he sat next to her. And according to what she told Gill, not only had Tom not proposed, he had made it clear that he had no intention of marrying her. She said, that's it, it's over, you know, can't do this anymore. Tom's phone calls turned out to be just as revealing as Jane's. Going over Tom's phone records, two calls in particular jumped out. Both were made on Saturday the 16th of September, the day after Jane and Tom's drive to the airport in France. The first call was to the local police. Thomas Cressmiller called the police and sought their help, uh, not so very long before he was indeed murdered. He said, can you send someone to separate us? Somebody's going to get hurt. But the dispatcher didn't take Tom's call for help seriously. He convinced Tom that there was no need to get the police involved. The uh, police constable who answered the telephone dealt with um, Tom Cressman with a, a certain amount of incredulity and cynicism. Don't ring me complaining that uh, your woman's going to get you. I just feel that as it was a man phoning in regard to domestic violence, that the person on the other end of the phone sort of shrugged his shoulders and said, Pooh, you know, he doesn't need any help. The second call detectives noted was the last phone call Tom Cressman ever made. It was to an unlisted number belonging to Lucinda Ellery, a friend of both Jane and Tom. So I remember getting the newspapers and then they're trying to trace a call that was made at a certain time. Such a, you know, of uh, such duration. It was the last person that Tommy spoke to. So I think that was me. Lucinda contacted the police immediately. She told them Tom had called her with the news that Jane had walked out on him. 
Tommy said she'd gone and it's all finished. It was over and done with. Never the twain shall meet. According to Lucinda, the words, she's gone, were barely out of Tom's mouth before Jane came back in the door. Yeah, I remember her saying, oh, I've got to go. She's here. No one heard from either Tom or Jane after that. Considering Tom was found dead two days later, the implication was obvious. As far as the detectives were concerned, Jane had killed Tom, then fled the scene. I feared she might flee the country because her passport was missing, her credit cards, her mobile phone, and certain other bits and pieces. But just as the police feared she had gone underground, Jane suddenly resurfaced. She phoned friends and, uh, and texted them. She was suddenly back in contact, according to Jane's texts, worried about Tom. While friends had been attempting to get in touch with her, she'd been just as frantically trying to reach him. Some of her texts would say things like, what's happened, what's happened to my Tommy? Was it possible that Jane really didn't know about Tom's murder? Several of Jane's friends contacted the police when they started receiving her text messages. Even though they now knew she hadn't been abducted, they were still worried for her safety. Some of those messages were conveying suicidal thoughts. Jane's desperation could be due to Tom's death or her guilt. Now that Jane was using her mobile, they were able to narrow down her location. We asked the mobile phone company to cell site where she was, tried to track her phone. Triangulating her phone's signal indicated she was somewhere in Cornwall. I suppose if you're on the run, it's a good place to run to because there aren't many people who live there. They also had help from Jane's friend, Lucinda. She'd finally managed to get Jane on the phone in the early hours of Wednesday, the 20th of September. With Jane still on the other line, she immediately contacted the police. According to Jane, she was calling from her car, which meant zeroing in on her exact location wouldn't be easy. I had officers up all night monitoring uh, her whereabouts. They all hoped they would find Jane in time. She spoke to me in a very distant way. She said she couldn't feel her legs. Maybe new information would point to a new suspect. She said he owed money to people and he was being blackmailed. By the morning of Wednesday, the 20th of September, 2000, Jane Andrews had been missing for four days and wanted by the police for two. We need to speak to her, A, to make sure she's not going to harm herself, and the second thing was to uh, arrest her and interview her about a possible murder. The victim was Jane's 38-year-old boyfriend, Tom Cressman. Tom had been found stabbed to death on the 18th of September, and evidence at the scene seemed to implicate Jane. Every airport, every seaport, uh, and everywhere where police have a control is, is uh, alerted to this woman's photograph, details, uh, name, address, all the rest of it. It did look bad for Jane. There's her boyfriend found in a, you know, a bloody mess, and Jane is nowhere to be seen. When Jane began texting friends, it was clear she wasn't out of harm's way. Jenny was completely irrational. Her mental state was hugely fragile. Her emotional state was completely wrung out. You know, the ramblings of a mad person, basically. The police had been tracking Jane all Tuesday night and into Wednesday morning using mobile phone transmitters. They knew Jane was on the move because she'd also called her friend Lucinda from her car. The police had given me a number, so I had Janie on one phone and the police on the other. She was um, very cooperative and, and was actually concerned for Jane's safety because she was, had the same opinion in me that she felt she might do something to herself. Lucinda had tried to get Jane to reveal her whereabouts, but Jane herself didn't seem to know. She seemed to be going in and out of almost like conscious, unconscious, slurry, etc. She told me she was in a side road, that she could see houses. Around 6.45 a.m., the police finally located Jane's car on the side of the road, about 200 miles west of London. She was eventually caught at the side of a road under a blanket in her car. She wasn't very lively. She'd been sleeping. 
She complained of being very cold. Jane told the officers she'd overdosed on paracetamol. She was rushed to the nearest hospital. Paracetamol can cause damage to your liver and kidneys. The hospital knew what she'd taken, so they were able to counteract that. Police at the time said another 20 minutes, half an hour, she would have been gone. By that afternoon, Jane's condition had stabilised. She also had visitors in from London. I sent two officers to the hospital that she was in to ensure that we retained any evidence that we needed. We had to get the permission of the doctor to sign her off to say she was fit for interview before we did that. While they waited for the doctor to give them the go-ahead, detectives searched Jane's car. We found evidence that she'd bought clothes en route down, some paperwork, her phone, and some other bits and pieces. None of which told them anything about Tom's murder or Jane's subsequent suicide attempt. But other items in the car did suggest that suicide hadn't been Jane's initial intention. She had access to funds so she could sustain herself. She bought clothes, so she intended to... She didn't intend to give herself up readily. On the 25th of September 2000, Jane Andrews was discharged from the hospital and into the custody of the Met. She was immediately arrested and taken back to London for questioning. In any major investigation, it's always important to get the suspect to talk so that they give a version of events. And our job as detectives, while she's given that version of events, is either prove or disprove it. When asked what had happened on the night of Saturday, September the 16th, Jane told them someone had broken into the house and attacked Tom. She said, you know, it was an intruder. The detectives immediately dismissed Jane's story. There was no evidence from the house to house or anybody else that a third party was involved. There was obviously no forced entry in the house and so on. Jane said Tom had recently made some dangerous enemies. She said he owed money to people and he was being blackmailed. We interviewed family, friends, business associates. None of them were aware of anything like this. But the police told Jane that what they did have was plenty of evidence that implicated her. Barbara had given us the background about the quarrel, the knife's missing from the kitchen, block in the kitchen. There's some post-it notes from Jane. All the facts contradicted her version. Faced with the evidence, Jane broke down. She said, yes, I killed him. Jane didn't confess to murder. Instead, she told detectives she killed Tom in self-defense. She claimed that she'd been driven to murder because of Tom's behavior that night. Jane told them she and Tom had been fighting from the moment they got back from France on Friday the 15th of September. On Saturday, things got worse. The core of it was that Tom Cressman had treated her badly. He was violent towards her. According to Jane, things got so bad she left the house to calm down. When she came back that evening, she went straight to bed. She thought everything would be all right in the morning, uh, which, it, which it had been in the past. But since Tom had been physical with her earlier, Jane said she'd taken precautions, placing the cricket bat and kitchen knife by the side of the bed. She says that she'd put them there for her protection. According to Jane, when Tom came into the bedroom later, he was physical again in more ways than one. Tommy had asked her for sex, and she had said, don't be so horrible, and tried to fight him off. And as a result, Tommy had hit her. After that, Jane claimed everything was a blur. Her story is she can't remember a lot. She said, he attacked me, I've defended myself, oh, look what's happened, I've stabbed him. I was suggesting it was all a bit of an accident. The next thing she remembered clearly was leaving. She left that house thinking she still may be pursued. She got into her car and drove. Jane ended her story insisting that Tom had been alive when she left. The police, however, were skeptical. If you do think that someone is dying that you know has stabbed, unless you want that man to die, you're going to phone the police and say, there's someone dying in my house. Please send an ambulance. Why didn't she do that? She didn't do that, she just left with a knife buried in his side. The interrogation over, 
they charge Jane with the murder of Tom Cressman. At trial, Jane added a shocking new detail to her account of Tom's death. They put Jane on the stand and she painted a dramatically different picture of the relationship than had been painted by her friends and Tom's friends. On the 23rd of April 2001, 12 years after she'd gone to work at Buckingham Palace, 33-year-old Jane Andrews found herself in a very different London landmark, the Old Bailey. Jane was on trial for the murder of her boyfriend, Tom Cressman. Because Jane had once worked for Sarah Ferguson, the Duchess of York, the tabloid press were having a field day. Once she got that situation, there was no way that it wasn't going to be uh, a very public case. They've now got, you know, her closest aide, and had been for the last 10 years, who's just murdered somebody. They must have thought all their Christmases had come early. And didn't it sell papers? And the publicity meant the trial was destined to be dramatic. You can't underestimate the size of that trial. It was in court number five in the Old Bailey, and it was packed. The prosecution opened by telling the jury that Tom Cressman's murder was a classic case of a woman scorned. When the Italian trip didn't result in the proposal Jane sought, she'd returned to London longing for something else, revenge. She stabbed him and hit him with a cricket bat, having gone to collect them from downstairs. Before she did it, uh, clearly with a murder in mind. The prosecution painted her as a sort of monster, I suppose. They even went so far as to describe the sound that Cricket Bat would have made on, uh, made when it hit his skull. And it wasn't just the evidence at the crime scene that would show Jane to be capable of cunning. Her conduct afterwards somewhat calculated, sending a series of misleading texts to throw investigators off the trail and to make her appear to be innocent of anything at a time when she knew she was guilty of killing him. The prosecution then called the police and forensic experts to walk the jury through the evidence. They had the bat, they had the knife, they had her dressing gown, which was spattered with uh, Tom's blood, all of which they uh, rather gruesomely, I suppose, held up in court uh, for everyone to get a good look at. The forensic pathologist who performed the post-mortem testified that Tom had died from a single stab wound. Death has been caused, in this case, by a knife into his heart. It was just one stab wound, which caused massive... I think from memory, it, it um, nicked uh, one of the major blood vessels either coming into or coming away from the heart, and he basically just... the heart just kept pumping and he bled to death. But Tom had not died quickly. Examining the cuts on Tom's hands, the pathologist told the jury he had come to a disturbing conclusion. Tommy had actually tried to pull the knife out. He's obviously tried to grab the knife, but there's probably so much blood around, it's slippery, and he probably didn't get a grip on it. He also testified that Tom had been hit on the forehead, and the cricket bat found near the body was probably the weapon. Detective Jim Dickey testified that another detail from the post-mortem helped them narrow down Tom's time of death to the early morning hours of Sunday, the 17th of September. His family and friends told us that he was as blind as a pat and he wasn't wearing glasses and he didn't have contact lenses in, which would indicate that he was either sleeping or preparing to sleep. It suggested that Tom had actually been in bed when he was attacked. I think he was probably asleep in bed or at the very least dozing. Detective Dickey told the jury Tom literally never knew what hit him. If you're falling asleep or asleep and someone hits you, you wake up with a bit of a shock. And before Tom had time to react, Jane struck again, this time with a knife. She must have been either standing or kneeling over him, and it's gone straight into the heart, and basically he bled to death. Tom's family was horrified to hear the details of his last moments. The sadness to me was that when I learned Tommy had actually tried to pull the knife out, and she'd just left him there to die, you know, which is just awful. But why had Jane killed the man she had hoped to marry? Both Tom's family and Jane's friends testified about Jane's state of mind before the murder. 
Tommy finally made it clear to her that he had no intention of marrying her. And this is what she could not bear. She snapped. I think there was just this unbelievable rage, and I think she lost it, really, really lost it. The prosecution rested its case on the 30th of April. After a decade in the shadows of the Duchess of York, it was Jane's turn in the spotlight. The defense opened by putting her on the stand. They put Jane on the stand and she painted a dramatically different picture of the relationship than had been painted by her friends and Tom's friends. Jane told the jury what she had told the police, that Tom had attacked her, forcing her to defend herself. But now she testified that she hadn't told the police the whole truth. She said he was trying to rape me. He'd done it earlier that day, and here he was doing it again. I could take no more of it. The rape wasn't the first time Tom had physically abused her, according to Jane. She claimed he had put her in casualty after one particularly bad incident. Jane tried to imply that my uncle Tommy had deliberately broken her wrist one evening when they were um, having a dinner party back at Tommy's house. At the time, she had told friends she'd slipped and fallen while dancing. The truth, as she told the jury, was that Tom had pushed her. When asked by her defence lawyer if she could explain to the jury why she had stayed with her abuser for so long, Jane made yet another surprising revelation. She was claiming abuse in childhood almost as an excuse for what she'd done. If you're being beaten or if you're being abused, that's normal. Maybe that, that does become normal because that is your normal life. On the 2nd of May, the prosecutor began his cross-examination by asking Jane why she hadn't told the police about the rape. When she came to the police station or the hospital, we would have taken swabs, we would have had her uh, examined appropriately, uh, and if that had been the case, we would have obtained evidence to support that. Jane's answer was simple. She said she was embarrassed and, and hadn't told them, which might well have might well have been the case. The prosecutor then asked why, after having left, she'd returned to the house the night of the murder. She had gone away when she came back. If you had walked away from an abusive relationship, why go back? And after coming back, why had she got into bed with her alleged abuser? Jane conceded even she didn't understand why. She was actually quite candid. She sort of said uh, she it didn't make any sense and that she was tired and she just wanted to go back to bed. Then the prosecutor confronted Jane with a piece of evidence the police had recovered from her car after her arrest. Brand new thong underwear, bought just hours after leaving the crime scene. She said that she had left the house in a hurry and uh, needed uh, something to wear. I questioned the thong as the garment of choice. By the second day of cross-examination, Jane's composure was beginning to crack. The prosecution basically made her look like she was changing. She'd changed her story and finally settled on one. On the 3rd of May, after three gruelling days on the stand, Jane finally reached her breaking point. When the prosecutor asked Jane about her alleged childhood abuse, she broke down. It was genuine emotional collapse. Uh, was quite apparent to us all. After three weeks of trial and two days of deliberations, the jury of ten women and two men had reached a verdict. In big trials, the moment of delivery of the verdict is a moment of very considerable tension and drama. Jane's trial had already had more than the usual share of dramatic moments, including Jane's shocking testimony that Tom had raped her. No, it was a surprise package, to be frank. Had the jury believed her allegations, Tom's family were worried when the jury foreman rose to read the verdict. The judge kept saying, if there's reasonable doubt, if there's reasonable doubt, if there's reasonable doubt, and we were all like, oh, God, you know, what if they feel that there is? There was also the matter of Jane's collapse on the stand two weeks earlier. How would that affect the jury's decision? Her circumstances were unusual and her vulnerabilities are understandable. There was always an element of doubt in my own mind that the result of the, of the um, verdict might not go in our favour. The jurors didn't harbour any such doubts, apparently. They found Jane Andrews guilty of Tom Cressman's murder.
A lot of the things that Jane said at the trial were lies. And I was very happy that the jury recognized them as lies. She was clearly a vulnerable individual, but that vulnerability in the view of the jury uh, was not to be typified by a sense of diminished responsibility, as we call it, for the act of killing. The judge sentenced Jane to life in prison. The judge called it a brutal attack. In ending uh, Tom's life, uh, she, she'd ruined her own. Jane's friends say she would not disagree with the judge's words. I don't think Janie will ever, ever, ever forgive herself. I think she's capable of very deep feeling and she's not cold and callous at all. I think, in fact, she's totally the opposite of that. Tom's family are grateful justice was done, but the verdict doesn't change the fact that they also have to live with a life sentence. It's something none of us will ever forget that we will always live with. Every family occasion, you will think Tom should be here for this. A friend of mine who'd also lost a son told me the one thing that was absolutely true. She said, you'll never get over it. You just have to learn to live with it. So that's what I've tried to do is learn to live with it. She murdered her mother and then chased down her little brother because he'd seen too much. A horrifying case tonight at 10 in brand new Evil Up Close.